Just speaking about how God is in control. Um, earlier this week, uh, an individual wanted DVDs, but they did not have a DVD player. So later that day, uh, someone called the church and said, hey, I got a DVD player. You know anybody who needs one? Bring it on down. And then on Friday, Friday, uh, I was delivering uh, the DVDs and uh, along with some other people delivering them. And, and one of the individuals I delivered them to, uh, I, I gave him the DVD and he was really excited. And he, but then he said, well, I, I don't have a DVD player. Like, okay, I mean, I'll make sure you get one. So I walked out, okay, Lord, provide one. Late, uh, later that evening, somebody came by my house and uh, dropped off a DVD. Praise God. God is in control. <laughs> and it's just so neat. That is just so neat how God is just taking care of his people. Good morning. Soli Deo Gloria. That is alone to God, the glory. He is on the throne. I hope that this morning finds you all well. For those listening online or maybe through our radio station or you're watching the live stream, I just want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Grants Pass where it is our desire to seek out the Lord going deeper, deeper in his word, deeper in prayer, so that we can go further as we go deeper. Here at Calvary, we study the, the Bible line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. And before we start this morning's passage, I would like us as a church to all turn to Psalm 24, and we are going to read together as a family. Psalm 24, I'll, I'll give you a, a few seconds to get there. Psalm 34. I'm sorry, 24. So hopefully I have the right address here. <laughs> Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up a soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Selah. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Selah. Amen. <laughs> now, if you would please turn with me to where we have been continually going through God's word. We're in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. Acts 15 on Wednesday, we ended uh, on verse 21. So we're going to pick it up. Acts 15, verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who is also named Barsabbas. And Silas, leading men among the brethren, verse 23, they wrote this letter to them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who were of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, verse 26, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. 
farewell. Verse 30. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. Verse 31. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Father, we come before you again this morning. We need to hear from you, Lord. We need to hear your words. We need to be touched by you. I just pray. In the name of your son, Jesus, that you, through your spirit, touch us, comfort us, encourage and convict us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. With the gospel of Jesus being preached to the Gentiles, the influx of Gentiles into the church, it produced a a problem which had to be solved. The mental background of the Jew was founded on the fact that God belonged to the chosen people via the Old Testament covenant between God and Abraham. In effect, the Jews believed that not only were they the peculiar possession of God, but also that God was the peculiar possession of the Jews. The two were intertwined. See, the Jews, they were special. They were chosen by God. But now that the gospel of Jesus had been opened wide to the Gentiles, a problem arose that had to be addressed. Judaizers, many who believed in Jesus, but still followed the Mosaic law. They came to the church in Antioch with the the story message that said that for Gentiles to be part of the new church, that they must become Jews, that the Gentiles, they must reject their ethnic backgrounds and instead accept the laws and the culture of the Hebrew religion. The Judaizers taught that Gentiles may become Christians, but only after first becoming Jews and submitting to all Jewish rituals, including circumcision. But Paul, he disagreed hotly, and the decision was put into the hands of the apostles, the elders of the mother church in Jerusalem. And with all opposing sides in attendance, there was a meeting in Jerusalem. This meeting would decide theologically what was essential for salvation. Was it necessary that before a Gentile, a pagan, become a member of the Christian church, should he be circumcised and take upon himself the law of Moses, or... Could he be received into the church by just believing in the salvation of Jesus? During this meeting, the apostle Peter, Barnabas, Paul, and finally James, the half-brother of Jesus and the leader of the Jerusalem church, all led by the Holy Spirit, spoke all stating that no circumcision nor the keeping of the Mosaic law was required to be part of the new church, to be included into the church of Christ. All that was needed, all that was needed was faith in Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the anointed one. See, it's not what we do, it's what Jesus has already done on the cross. It is faith, not works, that saves. Thus, after the speakers, there was no dissension. The matter settled. And once the church had come to its decision in Jerusalem, it acted with efficiency, urgency, and courtesy. The terms of the decision were embodied in a letter. And the letter was sent by no common messenger, but entrusted to Judas, or otherwise known as Barsabbas, and Silas, who went back to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who is also named Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Had Paul and Barnabas come back alone with the letter, their enemies, those who opposed them, might have doubted that they brought back the correct message from the mother church. Judas and Silas were official emissaries and guaranteed of the reality of the decision in the letter. So who were these two guys, Judas and Silas? Well, Judas or Barsabbas is thought to have been the brother of Joseph Barsabbas, one of the two men who were considered by the original apostles' disciples as a candidate 
to succeed the betrayer, Judas Iscariot. Barsabbas was really a surname. and meant son of the Sabbath. Maybe he was born on the Sabbath. And Silas, his name means person of the woods. Maybe he lived in a wooded area. Silas, he was not only an elder of the Jerusalem church, but he was also a Roman citizen. And later, as we go in Acts, we will see that he will become Paul's traveling companion on Paul's second missionary journey. He is referred to by his Roman moniker, Silvanius, in several of Paul's epistles. These two men, verse 22 says, they were chosen and leading men in the church. They were well-known and highly respected among believers because of their moral character. How they lived their lives showed others their faith and their moral standards. Is yours or mine. Do we live our lives in such a manner that others know and respect our moral character, our moral fiber? Do we live our Christian theology to the point that it is intertwined and woven daily in our words, in our deeds, in our actions, even in our thoughts? Scripture says that we should search our hearts. Something to think about. It was with these two men. They lived their lives in such a way that others knew. They were highly respected, the believers. And these two men, the church sent them to deliver and authenticate the letter, which really was a wise move by the church to send these guys. See, this would give weight to the news and make sure that it was fully understood the letter was an official decision by the mother church in Jerusalem. If Paul and Barnabas had carried it back alone, some might doubt the message or that it wasn't validated. The church was also wise in sending live bodies as well as a letter to give audible voice to the decision, just a letter could have sounded coldly official. But the words of Judas and Silas, they added a, a friendly warmth that the bare reception of a letter could never have achieved. Verse 23. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. So the letter, the letter was written and sent by the apostles, the elders, the leaders of the Jerusalem church. It came from the highest authority. It was addressed to all the Gentile churches and everywhere else where churches might be found. The actual letter starts off with greetings. Greetings. The word for greeting is karo. It means to rejoice, to be glad. The leaders from Jerusalem in this letter, we're basically saying, hey, we bid you to rejoice, be glad. And the Gentile churches had much to rejoice about, much to be glad about the divisive issue of circumcision and what was necessary for salvation was settled. Salvation is based on grace and belief through faith of Jesus. It is the gift of God to us. Rejoice. I don't need to be circumcised. I don't need to... Follow the law, all 600 plus. Rejoice. Brethren, we should rejoice. Always, Scripture says, always. And if you're having a bad day, just tell yourself the gospel of Jesus, what he did for you and what awaits you in heaven. Verse 24, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So after the warm greeting, the first thing of the letter was to isolate the false teachers, the false teaching. Some who went out from us, these men had come pretending to have an endorsement 
of the Jerusalem church. But in fact, they were imposters, and their work was one of subversion. See, they had their own agenda. They had their own gospel, one of works. They neither had the backing of the elders or of the Holy Spirit. We are always to scrutinize what is being taught from this pulpit. Scrutinize what is being taught against what Scripture has already said. We are to be Bereans to know the Word of God, to know what is true, thus knowing what is false. I encourage you, I exhort you to read your Bible every single day. Study your Bible. Know the truth. Because if you know the truth, thus you will know what is false. The leaders of the Jerusalem church, they wanted it known that not only they had no part in this legalistic teaching, but they disassociated themselves from it altogether. They rebuked it. Cut ties from it. As Christians, we are to be loving at all times. But there comes a time when turning the other cheek and grace gives way to truth. The idea that love embraces everything is wrong. The love of God reaches out to everyone. That is true, but love does not embrace error. There comes a time with those who propagate false and divisive teachings. They must be confronted, their teachings denounced, and their errors exposed. See, we are to stand for truth. And sadly, there is a movement within the church of all inclusiveness, universalism, teaching, that ultimately God is, he's so big, he's so huge, he's so loving that there are many ways to heaven and enlightenment. Many roads will get you into heaven. But you see, what that does, it diminishes what Jesus did on the cross, if not abolish it outright. It is straight from hell. And beware. Bible-believing Christians cannot accept the many past view as a genuine expression of the Christian faith. Yet some professing Christians consider this inclusive stance to be the new, loving, enlightenment. Liberal Christianity offers a humanistic reinterpretation and claims that fundamental, uh, fundamental Christians that we are stuck in rigid and outdated thinking. They tell us the times have changed. Society has progressed, and the church must evolve to stay relevant. The church must evolve. Right, right there, that's a clue. They twist the Bible as the living word to make it open to new radical revelation. So that's its original meaning is turned upside down as society and opinions change. White is black and black is white. Most everybody turns to gray. In Hebrew, chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Martin Luther said, The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. Neither the writer of Hebrews nor Martin Luther meant that the Bible is subject to revision or new revelations according to shifting public taste and political moods. See, the Bible doesn't change. It changes us. It changes us. If we disagree with something we read in Scripture, it's not the Bible that needs changing. It is us. We must re-examine our opinions and change them in the light of God's unchanging word. Many a church, they are asleep at the wheel, being led into apostasy and error. While the nation is being led into secularism, universalism, moral 
relativism and depravity. So much of the church has sidelined itself and made itself irrelevant at the very time, the very time that the world is in desperate need of Jesus, in need of the word of God, in need of God's truth. God's message hasn't changed since the beginning of time. It remains the same. We as believers of the gospel, we must stand for truth and the word of God. I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. Who do you stand with today? Verse 25. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The trouble in Antioch and elsewhere had been caused by unauthorized messengers. The Jerusalem leaders wanted the Gentile churches to know that these present messengers were not only sent to undo the damage done, but that they were fully accredited and all acting with one accord. This phrase, with one accord, first occurs in the New Testament in Acts, chapter 1, verse 14, in connection with the unanimous decision of the believers in the Lord, Jesus together in the upper room for prayer. All four here, Judas, Silas, Paul, Barnabas, they were in like manner. They were all together. Also, I want you to note in the letter, the word about Barnabas and Paul, what was said, was especially warm, expressing the appreciation felt by the Jerusalem church for the work that those two were doing for the Lord. They had risked their lives, verse 26 says. The word risk, it means to give over into another's power or use, to permit or allow. These two, they were doulos. Willing slaves, servants unto Christ. They were allowing Christ to work in them and through them. The definition of doulos, one who gives himself up to another's will, devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interests. They gave up all to serve God for the Lord's sake. Paul and Barnabas, they had given up their homes. They had given up their land. They had given up their comfort. They had given up their families. Friends, all that most people covet. But they would, as 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 tells us, they would reap joy unspeakable and full of glory in seeing souls saved, lives transformed, churches planted, friends made for eternity, and thereafter a place of honor in the kingdom of heaven. Are we willing to risk it all for Jesus? We need to ask ourselves that. Are we willing to give up all that this world has to offer to serve and glorify God? This past week, I wasn't really able to sleep much, so I found myself up at night, and after praying for a while, I I have to admit, I found myself watching a few different exposés about the movie and music industry. How many have made a pack with the devil for success here on earth, for power, prestige, for the praise of man? It's amazing. They don't even hide it. If you know what to look for, it is easy to see. It's all out in the open. And these individuals... who are stars, celebrities, treated like gods here. They live their lives for what they can gain here on earth, treasures that they can accumulate. They are living for now. They are living for today for themselves. Benjamin Franklin said, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. All of us will have to give an account of our lives. Verse 27. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. Verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. The Jewish law said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. These two accredited messengers, Judas, Silas, would be able to tell the whole story of the Jerusalem meeting, how the decision was made and portray the, portray the genuineness and warmth in the letter that they held. Audible voices. Letters, texts, even the most friendly are poor substitutes for word of mouth communication. How often are our texts misinterpreted, misunderstood? <laughs> Once in a while, I'll send a text to my wife or something. She'll send a back question. I'm like, I'm like, what did you just say? That's not what I meant. Judas and Silas would be able to give the added dimensions impossible in a letter. There would be no misinterpretations. There would be no misunderstandings. Moreover, any opposer still disaffected by the false teaching could cross-examine, cross-question these two who were officially sent to help undo the damage by the false teachers. Verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. There it is, out in the open at last, attested to by the Holy Spirit himself. Good to the Holy Spirit. In the selection of the very language of this letter, the Holy Spirit overruled all the human disputing, all of the discussion, division. All the details of this special meeting. He was in control. See, the Holy Spirit, he had planned the arena of the meeting to be in Jerusalem. He had planned the agenda of the meeting so that Peter spoke first, then Barnabas and Paul, to tell of their thrilling missionary journey. And finally, for the elder of the church in Jerusalem, James, to speak. The Holy Spirit had prompted Peter in what to say. He had overruled the natural tendencies of James, who was legalistic. He engineered the whole thing to settle the question of faith, freedom, and fellowship in the church. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, and to us. The apostles and the elders speaking for the whole church, they were so conscious of the Holy Spirit leading in all this that they added their voice to his as a vehicle through whom the Holy Spirit spoke. They were confident that they were his mouthpiece. The Holy Spirit always has his way in the end. He does not force his will, nor does he coerce. He remains invisible, inaudible, but infinite and infallible, guiding in all things to work out his sovereign will. His sovereign will. We must remember that in life, when so often it seems that everything has gone wrong, or that men have somehow been able to destroy, disrupt. Truth and the will of God will prevail. Will prevail. The Holy Spirit 
never loses, never fails, never deviates from his purpose, which is to glorify God. His will always will prevail in the end. And the devil is no match for the Holy Spirit of God. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. These necessary things, the Greek word for necessary is eponychus. It's the only place in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit uses this word. It means compulsory. That which is required. And there are four things that are eponychus, required. Verse 29 that you abstain from these, from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled. And if you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. The Gentiles, they miss, must abstain from any involvement, even by association with idolatry. They must abstain eating food that would offend Jewish consciences, food with blood still present or food that had been strangled. And they must abstain from immorality. These are all things Gentiles could observe without compromising their freedom in Christ. If the Jews were to give up their insistence on circumcision and keeping the Mosaic law, then the Gentiles could give up these few things also. Verse 29 lays it out. What was necessary and expected of the Gentiles and the four, they were all reasonable. In application, to us to follow Christ, we must give up our idols. See, an idol is anything that we put before God. It's amazing what we as humans can make idols. Cars, sports, hobbies, work, family, our ministry, nothing should go before God. We must give up our idols. We must give up our immoral desires, our wants. We must turn away from them and turn towards Christ for Christ. The word for keep in verse 29 means to keep carefully, to ponder. The only other place the word is used is in connection with the mother of Jesus, Mary. After Jesus was found in the temple with the teachers, Mary scolded him, but Jesus answered in Luke chapter 2, verses 49 and 50, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he had spoke to them. Then if you read verse 51, it states his mother kept all these things in her heart. She remembered them. She pondered them. She thought about them. She never let them get away from her. See, that was the kind of Diligent keeping of the request that was to be expected of the Gentiles in the church to remember these four things and to keep them. Verse 30. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. Verse 31. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. They rejoiced over its encouragement. Encouragement. Thus, Barnabas lived up to his name. His name means son of consolation or exhortation, encouragement. He was always encouraging people. I can imagine what the Gentiles in Antioch were thinking and how anxious they were in waiting for the decision from the mother church. 
There is nothing harder than waiting, especially something as crucial as this. The hours, the days must have seemed just to drag on. And always the nagging thought persisted. Those Gentiles at the church in Antioch, what if the news is bad from Jerusalem? What if we have to be circumcised? What if we have to keep the law? What if we have to work our way into heaven? Will I be good enough? In their minds, I'm sure that hope, despair, battled back and forth for the victory. The letter then was read amid great rejoicing. Great rejoicing. Scripture doesn't tell us what happened to the Judaizers. Perhaps they didn't come back to Antioch knowing full well that their false credentials had been exposed. Or maybe they were still there hoping that legalistic sentiment in the church would rise up. In any case, that letter exposed and discredited the false teaching. But more would come, more to follow. You see, Satan, he is always trying to tear down truth, tear down the word of God, and tear down those who love God. And he will always have his minions doing his bidding, trying to dissuade, discourage, divide, defeat the brethren through deception, to get our eyes off of Jesus and onto ourselves, and then onto others, and then other things. And before we realize it, we are immersed in sin. We are trapped and chained by our works by our addictions, by our idols, our immoralities, and our fellowship with God the Father is severed, broken. Sin will do that. It will blacken our hearts and break the communion, the communion, the common union that we have with God. Our God, God is God of love. Mercy, grace. He is righteous and holy. And because he is holy, nothing unholy can have a relationship with him. That's why he gave us his son, to die. To die so that we might live and have communion with God the Father through Jesus. When Jesus hung on the cross, his last words, last phrase was to tell us die. It is finished. And then he died. To us in today's culture, to tell us die, it is finished, isn't really part of our culture. But back in Jesus' day, it was a well known word or phrase with heavy implications. In the ancient Roman Empire, criminals would have a stone tablet outside their prison cells stating the offenses that they had committed. If they were able to live long enough to get out of the prison, the prison guards would write to Telestai across the tablet, meaning the person had paid his debt for his trespass in full. He could not be put in jail again for the offenses that had been committed. To tell us die. It is finished. Jesus paid for our debt in full. Last Sunday, we celebrated Easter or Resurrection Day when Jesus rose from the dead, from the grave, from the tomb in victory. And I want to remind you that Jesus has taken all of your sins, past, present, and future to the grave, and when he arose, he left them there for those who believe in his name, for salvation. For those who do, you cannot be judged for your sins anymore. We no longer are defeated by sin, but we have victory over death through Jesus. Jesus is a gift to us. 
He is our King of glory, as we read in Psalm 24. But we must accept this gift. God will never violate the sanctity of our free will. It is our decision. Each one of us will have to decide who Jesus is to us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you humbly. And in your word, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 1, it says, and the Lord spoke. The Lord spoke. Perhaps no sweeter words in Scripture. Father, I pray that through your Holy Spirit that you speak to us today. By your Holy Spirit, speak to the unsaved this morning with an invitation of salvation. By your Holy Spirit, speak to the wandering saint with words of encouragement and restoration. By your Spirit, speak to those who are standing firm in you with words of commendation. By your Spirit, draw us all in to you. To you. Speak to us. I pray, Father, change us. Change us. In the name of your Son, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you've been listening, watching, and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, But if you would, give me a call. I'll pray with you over the phone. My number is 530-400-1566. If you've been struggling, you're a believer, but you've been struggling. And you want to come clean, call me. I'll pray with you. And for those who are doing strong, awesome. Keep reading your Bible. Keep seeking the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord give you peace. God bless.